So good afternoon, it's two o'clock. Uh, so I think we will start. Um, thank you to everybody for joining today, our Exertus Education Spotlight. I believe this is the second session that we've done as a business. Uh, and we've got some fantastic guests on the panel today from both our manufacturer community and some from the education community as well. So um, just to set the scene, uh, we'll be talking today about how technology uh, for students has changed the learning in the modern workplace. Obviously, we've been through a, a, a challenging year uh, with a number of headwinds, uh, largely caused by COVID-19 pandemic. And that's really thrust us not just in the workplace, but within education into new ways of working. Um, and what we want to do today is talk about how technology has changed the world that we live in and how technology can help us to adapt to these modern ways. So I think, first of all, if I may introduce myself, I'm Jamie Brothwell, Commercial Director, um, and I'll be hosting today's panel chat. And let's go round, um, if we start with, with Duncan, who's next to me on the screen, uh, if everyone wants to do a quick uh, round robin and introduce themselves. Thanks, Jamie. Yes, I'm Duncan Peabody. I've been involved in EdTech for learning and teaching spaces since as long ago as um, 2005, when I worked on some projects in a commercial capacity, i.e. selling them on behalf of a vendor at the University of Nottingham. And that took me into a more of a consultancy around how how ed digital technology especially can help learning and teaching. Um, in 2015, I innovated a learning spaces roadshow. I realized that um, lots of the various aspects required weren't being brought together. We created pop-up classrooms that brought everything together, and that was fairly successful, and that became a part of GISC. And then once the pandemic hit last year, I'd, a I'd, I'd started to develop a real interest on, in remote learning solutions. Um, there are already some out there that people know, like the Barco virtual classroom and things like that. And I wanted to try and, as I'll talk about in a little bit longer later, to try and expand on that interest. Thank you. And over to Ed. Hello there. Um, my name's Ed Fairfield. I'm vice chair of uh, NACE. NACE is a, an EdTech uh, charity, uh, so we're dedicated to helping schools uh, use, make the best use of technology to advance education. Um, I'm also a school governor responsible for ICT provision, um, a lovely primary school in Wakefield. And most recently, I'm a, a long suffering dad of a four-year-old and a seven-year-old trying to teach them about shapes and vertices and uh, phonics um, at home while struggling everything else so technology has obviously uh, formed a key part of that so i have uh, a few different perspectives on on the world of uh, tech and and also how it how it's going to uh, transform i think uh, education in future Thanks, Ed. And uh, let's start with our, our manufacturer guests today, Chris. Good afternoon, all. Uh, Chris Godsalve. I'm the channel sales manager for AVA um, Europe, um, looking after our education and our pro AV portfolios across the UK. Thanks, Chris. And Craig. Cheers, Jamie. Um, I'm Craig Foster. I'm European Sales Manager for Lock and Charge. Uh, we pr uh, produce storage, charging, and sanitization solutions for mobile devices. I think I've been with Lock and Charge now coming up to five and a half years. And prior to that, uh, I've been working as a reseller for 10 to 15 years, and predominantly most of that time has been selling into education. So I think I've got a good idea of the vendor and the distribution side of things, and also the uh, the challenges that the resellers will be coming up against as well. Great, thanks, Craig and Nick. Famous phrase sure. used currently. Uh, <laughs> Can't hear you. <laughs> I actually had a call with somebody earlier who's got it on their T-shirt. It says you're on mute on the T-shirt. Do you know what? I've never done that. I'm sure I've never done that. This is the first <laughs> time, so apologies, everybody. Um, uh, yeah, hi, everybody. Uh, Nick Walter. I'm, uh, I head up um, the, the commercial business here at Acer. Um, been at Acer for 10 years and uh, in the industry now for, for going on 25 plus. So, um, yeah, I think um, it's uh, obviously challenging times as to echo what Ed, Ed has, uh, has, has sort of highlighted. 
also uh, a suffering uh, a pair in our home uh, trying to deal with the, the challenges from working from home and uh, and uh, and involved in the uh, the learning from home piece so uh, yeah I think we've all got uh, on the panel all of experiences of the challenges right now so yeah that, that's that's me excellent and David by no means least uh, across the pond David Yes, uh, good afternoon everyone. Uh, David Lopez from ScreenBeam. I am the Senior Alliance Manager for our education team. Um, on, a, on a global level, run our education messaging. I, I come from the classroom originally as a classroom teacher, um, working with school districts here in the United States, um, uh, previously with Microsoft on their training team and working with schools all over the country, uh, from New York uh, to LA to Miami uh, and everywhere in between. Uh, but been with ScreenBeam about six years now and um, used ScreenBeam in my classroom and in my teaching before I came to work for the company. Uh, but uh, certainly seeing a lot of differences and changes in the company in the last six years, uh, but especially in the last year um, in, in our approach to how we use technology in the classroom um, and even some of our work from home strategies that we've had to kind of develop in, in the use of uh, what we do. So looking forward to talking with everyone today. Thank you, David, and thank you to all the panel for your for your introductions. Now we know who we all are. Um, I wanted to welcome our reseller guests to the seminar today. Uh, thank you very much for taking your time. We hope today's session will be very useful. Uh, we'd like to give you something as a as a thank you as well for joining. Our partner STM have offered their Game Change backpack, uh, which all of you are able to claim uh, as a free gift uh, for participating today. So we will send out details to you following this to give you the details of how to claim that. Um, just to set the tone of what we're going to do and what we're going to cover today in the session, uh, we're going to hand over to Ed and to Duncan. Um, working within education, they have a great insight into how uh, the challenges have been dealt with by uh, schools, colleges and alike and the Education Authority over the course of the last 12 months. So we're going to listen to them and then we're going to talk more about with the panellists around from a manufacturer perspective, how are they best placed to support you, the end customer and the Education Authority with their offering uh, as we move forward and the insights that they found over the last 12 months as well. So we believe that will be very useful. Um, so I'll hand over now to, to Ed and Duncan to kind of set the scene in terms of the reality of what the last 12 months has been from an education perspective. Thank you, Jamie. First of all, can I have a free backpack as well as a panelist? <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, I will arrange. I'll pay for it out of my own pocket if necessary, Ed, as a thank I'll, you. I'll, I'll stay online then. Thank you. <laughs> no problem. Um, so as Jamie says, um, I'm here uh, with a perspective of, um, of education. Uh, that's in my role, as I say, at uh, NACE, EdTech Charity. Uh, we work with hundreds and hundreds of uh, schools um, all the time, various guises, whether it's uh, an advisor or, or uh, um, an assessor or uh, whatever else it, it, it might be. So we have a unique insight into the specific challenges of technology versus the enormous range of other challenges schools have. Um, I also have a more kind of granular insight into uh, the day-to-day -day challenges of uh, a working busy primary school um, as a, a school governor um, and that goes down to the, the shipping of food parcels to to um, to houses and everything like that and all, all of that combination of, of, uh, of stress that um, your, your, your busy primary school is going through at the moment. Um, so I'd like to paint the picture starting from kind of five, ten years ago, really, where um, funding, well, more like ten years ago, where funding for schools was um, uh, done so differently. Uh, local authorities were, were had a more prominent role in education. Uh, local authorities had specific technology advisors. Uh, schools had somewhere to go uh, to get uh, CPD, to get technology advice they had a um they, they had in-house uh, local authority it teams uh, and they had a, a range of different um kind of official independent sources of uh, advice and information um so partly down to uh, government funding and michael gove and uh, the bexer organization being uh, disbanded um partly due to the emergence of multi-academy trusts as well 
uh, that kind of go-to source of independent trusted information uh, has fallen by the wayside um, which is which is an enormous gap it's left an enormous gap um, in uh, technology provision um, in in schools so initially that was fine because uh, the schools were riding on the back of, of recent investment from the government um, you know early 2000s and um, but as more local authorities schools turned to turned into academies the original local authority IT guys started setting up on their own uh, that gap kind of widened so in the scenario of a school who thinks I've heard about these uh, Chromebooks or, or my Wi-Fi is dodgy uh, they didn't really have anywhere to go um, and they kind of scrabbled around they talked to their commercial IT partner uh, they may have an old uh, local authority advisor and they didn't really have that trusted source of advice um, whilst that was happening it became more complex with Department for Education guidelines and, and then government policy and shrinking budgets uh, and all of that kind of imploded uh, to um, basically destroy technology support in, in schools I would say um, then bringing in pre-COVID-19 you've got the day-to-day -day challenges the busy head teacher has uh, behavior safeguarding uh, the leaky roof as I often refer to which all schools seem to have a leaky roof um, uh, Ofsted knocking on the door, uh, the, the, the angry parent in the playground uh, that, that's complaining that uh, her, her child hasn't been set homework correctly. Um, all of that added to the, to the carnage um, and EdTech became a very important but not urgent kind of uh, activity to focus on. Um, and because it wasn't urgent, it wasn't banging on the, the door like the angry parent or like Ofsted, it became kind of, a, it'll be fine, it, you know, it, it's a bit dodgy, it's a bit, it's not quite working, you know, uh, as it should. We haven't really got anywhere to go, we haven't got any money anyway, so we'll just kind of leave it ticking over. Um, and that has perpetuated um, all the way up until March 2020. Um, and uh, then it all hit of course it all it all went peak tong as it were with uh, with covid um and uh, schools all of a sudden their pupils were at home and they thought goodness me how are we going to deliver effective education to these people at home um some schools had technology already there was a minority of schools who had microsoft teams in place for example or google um, or had a savvy IT guy or girl who, who could support them. Um, the vast majority were like, ah, what do we do? Uh, print some PDFs home, hand deliver this, uh, put stuff on our website, uh, send them to, to uh, BBC Bite Size, chaos, uh, a lack of uh, coordination, and every kind of school went, did their own thing, um, which wasn't really very helpful for anybody. Um, lockdown two was, was, was different, of course, schools uh, were, were carried on going in. Lockdown three, which we're in now, um, it's calm, calmer compared to lockdown one. Um, and a larger proportion of schools are ready. Uh, they've got your Microsoft Teams in place. They've got their routines of providing homework, of uh, uh, taking it back and providing feedback. Uh, the DFE and Ofsted are clear on what remote learning guidelines need to be and there's kind of an equilibrium there, there's, a, there, there's a, a, a procedure that people go through, they can press go and, and it just happens, um, which is fabulous. Uh, so now we're in a position where in a couple of weeks schools are returning uh, or fully reopening um, and all of a sudden EdTech is front and centre of their consciousness, they're like right this technology thing it's actually pretty good and we've been forced to use it for, for, for the past year, whether it's visualizers or, or, or online cloud computing or whatever, we kind of get it now, it works and it's our friend. Um, um, we need to capture that opportunity now, or you as resellers, uh, because it's now front and center, it's high on the agenda, it's in the important and urgent category. Um, and it will remain so for the foreseeable future. So you're going to have schools Googling, uh, talking to their IT guys, 
talking to their multi-academy trust ICT departments um, because they have to and they want to because they know it works. Um, so the iron is hot um, and uh, it's up to us as a, an industry of um, well, up to you, uh, the community and money to, to embrace that, to make sure that you're there to, uh, to support schools as, as they need and, and as they deserve. So there's your challenge. Thank you, Ed. That's really, really interesting. Um, keen to get Duncan's uh, input as well to add to that. Yeah, I've got a slightly different perspective because my experience is all around further and higher education. And uh, almost uh, an hour and a quarter ago, the Office for Students released their report. They've been doing a big review over the last nine months into what the digital future of higher and particularly higher education but also it touches on further education could be so they just released this gravity assist report and there's a couple of striking things in there that i think are interesting certainly from a reseller perspective and, and, and equipping some of these spaces because I, because lots of things have changed but the, the, from the surveys they've done across hundreds of institutions and hundreds of colleges they found that only 21 percent of staff feel confident with technology the same questions were asked to students, and the students come in at about 49%. So you've got students who are competent with technology, expecting technology to be used, and yet the staff are not there to deliver it. So whatever we whatever we do as resellers and consultants and putting things in, it's got to be about ease of use for one. It's got to absolutely be about ease of use. Um, and, some and, and I think more and more that's also not about saying, here's solution A and put it in, it's about putting something together that works in a better way that that needs collaboration between between vendors as well so we've gone to we've gone from a situation really where you know the online the online education element that people like the um open university and coursera uh, future learn deliver that was always targeted as non-traditional students it was people who are in the workplace maybe wanting to upscale uh, people who were looking after you know maybe looking after doing caring or something they, they couldn't go and access you know full-time on-campus education whether that's K, obviously not k-12 won't be working but whether it's f-u-h-e but now that's changed because everybody's been doing online education and of course it started off as an emergency thing it had to happen on the 23rd of march last year what did all the academics turn to they turned to the things they had already installed on their on their computers which was teams and zoom predominantly but there were some other things so great unified commu communication tools but are they necessarily the best things for learning and teaching um, and you know i guess most of you watching this now are seeing the seven of us on screen what if that what if you've got a class of 30 and you're all little thumbnails it isn't a good experience it's not a good experience for you as the tutor because you can't see your students you can't gauge that feedback body language are they engaged are they you know are they having some problems and also the student isn't getting this they're not getting the same experience they were getting in the classroom with you being able to walk around and you know go and point at different things and, and show things so you know that that whole that whole um say environment's changed i i was on something last week where some very um some, some very well respected um architects Faulkner and browns up in newcastle are saying you know campuses are the future will not have lecture spaces we will not be putting all people together on campus anymore technology has been able to deliver that for a long time just as the unified communications and teams and zoom they've been able to do it for a long time it's the culture that's changed it's our response to the pandemic and also we and also we've discovered that some things work better when they're delivered in that way you know um and you know crucially i think the business recognized that as well business were expecting people working at home productivity would drop off and that's not been the case um throughout most knowledge-based industries the reports have been actually the different so we need to, so there's going to be a lot of hybrid spaces there's going to be a lot of spaces created because you know we now this has happened every single senior leadership team at every university is going to have pandemic on their risk list for moving forward it can't happen in any other way that could be quite a good thing because um a we don't want to go back because i think going back is is detrimental there's lots to build on here and say so i think we're only in the infancy of this there's a lot more we can do certainly with ed tech because it's that ease of use um ed touched on digital poverty you know what, uh, it's all right students being remote and learning remote but what if they haven't got the right equipment or any equipment what if they haven't got any connectivity you know those things go away in the classroom <clears throat> everybody's parity <clears throat> but now we're increasing different things and and some of those things ed tech can't uh, you know we 
some of those have got to come out of government policy and are you going to equip every student with a laptop or a Chromebook or, or some device? You know, those, those are things that if we're going to learn and teach in this way, there has to be wholesale thinking. So, you know, this crisis could actually be a great, I think it should be a great opportunity, but there's got to be um, government policy and leadership in, in that respect as well. Um, you know, one of the things that I'm, I know Chris quite well, I'm working on a project with Chris at the moment, which is about developing a new learning environment where the teacher can teach as if they're in the, or they are in the classroom, the students can see it as good as possible as if they were on campus, even though they're not. But, but how we're going about that isn't saying to uh, colleges and universities, here's a product, put it in and get on with it. It's a case of, well, let's develop it with you. We're in those early stages at the moment because you're, you're, you know, technology must only enable. Technology can't dictate what they do in the classroom. They've got to put pedagogy first. They've got to work out what the, you know, what what are the best engagements with with students online at the different age groups. Now, how long should a session be? You know, I've I've, <laughs> I've seen some of these webinars and things have been two and a half hours. Well, you know, you can see the number of participants dropping off as you go through it because nobody wants to sit there for two and a half hours. Students can't do that. Can you do breakout groups? You know, so we know, you know, Zoom and Teams have got that now. So, that, so that those are things that you need to determine that you want to bring into your learning and teaching. And what is the technology to support that? So it has to be that way around. You know, we need to we need to have those environments where students aren't just in the room on a little two-inch thumbnail on a, on a teacher's laptop. They've got to be almost in real size on a big screen, so we can see their faces, we can get their attention, see their attending, we can see if they're understanding. We've got to be able to have technology that does polls and quizzes and lots of those are out there. But again, it's that ease of use because we know that, you know, they've had a learning and teaching excellence within higher education for many years now, but there's been no CPD in it, massive opportunity lost, you know. So those that haven't wanted to engage with technology haven't, and they've been left behind a little bit at the moment. So, you know, there's a massive amount of, you know, 325 million of funding for digital transformation about to come into further education from the first first of April. That's a massive opportunity to get with those um, educators, but to demonstrate that it isn't just about technology, technology, you've got to have those conversations that, that show that you understand that there's learning and teaching in there. And they're the things that they're going to be really interested in. Um, so. That's what we've got to enable because I say it won't just be the threat on, on everybody's risk register that there might be a COVID-22, God forbid, but you know, climate change, we've all seen so many examples in this last year of where the environment's got better, where there's more wildlife around, where there's less pollution in the city centres. So maybe working remote and learning remote can help sustain some of that moving forward. But only if say it's beyond what we can do as um, advisors and as suppliers because it has to be that government intervention and policy and, and a will to do it but i think you know it's, it's something in many aspects with the fees you know look at all the look at all the complaints from students about we're paying these fees and we've had like one hour online a week and we've we've had to we've had to pay for accommodation we've not used um i, I as part of the office for students report that i saw the first half an hour of you know, student. I know this. I know the education system is slightly different in the states, but the debt of students, which goes back longer than us, is now one point. I'm going to have to look. One point six trillion dollars of student debt. It's the highest debt in the states, apart from mortgage debt. It's the next thing. It's more than business debt. It's 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 horrendous. And what this pandemic's done for them as well is two things that we need to be very mindful of that we we can't change on this call. But um, they've had 30% unemployment within throughout higher education because because they've not had the students in to basically pay the staff and they, their, their employment means they can be very agile about getting rid and, get, and, and also taking on staff as well. They've had a 21% drop of higher education applications from, low, from, from students from low, low economic backgrounds. So unless we do the technology, you know, and Nick and Ace can probably help with lobbying government and getting them to, you know, to make sure these types of things happen. But unless those things happen in at the low end, that's going to be the consequence. And so it's probably because the system is it's not broken, but it's damaged. There is an opportunity from this crisis that you know, will benefit all of us. But more importantly, going to benefit the students, whether they're K-12 or college students or university undergraduates so there's a there's a lot of things there to unpack but uh, i think there's a real opportunity there for everybody brilliant no thank you so much duncan and thank you to ed i think it's great to get that insight into what the education side of of, of the of, um of kind of has seen 
and experience. And I've certainly learned a lot from speaking to both of you over the last few days. Um, taking everyone back to the 23rd of March uh, last year when the when lockdown one started, you know, certainly in our business, we saw a huge uh, demand for devices initially. Um, and I think what's so interesting listening there to, to Ed and Duncan is how people are now starting to evolve and think, what other technology? You know, technology effectively became the fourth emergency service. Uh, and, you know, we've never been more reliant on technology uh, and how we build that ecosystem. And I think with the vendors we have on today, we really do have a representation of an ecosystem of products. And, you know, going back to that device point that I made, uh, I'm keen really to speak to, to Nick in terms of, you know, the strain upon supply chain um, and how the how the COVID uh, pandemic has impacted the roadmap and development of product and what the key challenges that Acer saw in terms of the rollout of devices. Yeah, so I've got I'm not on mute this time, which is good. Uh, thanks, thanks, Jamie. Um, yeah, I think you know everybody, um, all resellers are, are probably well aware of all the challenges that that are going on right now in. Um, you know, in the marketplace, I think uh, you know it's from from an OEM you know vendor perspective. You know, we we've 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 never seen uh, demand like it. Certainly, I mean, I've been in the industry as I said, sort of twenty five plus years, and I've never seen demand like this. And um, when you when you mix in the the challenges of Brexit, uh, global pandemic, um, we've got other issues as well, which is um you know real um issues on um raw components such as such as silicon or raw materials such as silicon um from now you know electric vehicles in the auto industry for example so it, it's 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 like almost like a perfect storm is, is suddenly hit um and it's it's really challenging for for, for the entire industry um it's it's something which um you know everybody's impacted right now and um you know what we're what we're starting to sort of see in terms of anticipate is sort of towards the sort of q3 time that we'll start to see the the, the global supply chain try and catch up um and i you know this is this is nobody's got a crystal ball right now um but um you know that what what we're expecting is supply will ease up at come sort of q3 time but I, st I still see that this year is going to be still have major issues. You know, CPU process. You know, CPUs are in, in huge um, supply issues. The panels are all being effective. As I said, the auto industry is probably a key part of that, which is consuming those panels now. So, all big big uh, auto companies are now basically putting you know uh, flat screen panels into their into their cars as they go more down the electric vehicle route. That's having an impact on consumer electronics industries, all other industries, and obviously the IT industry as well. So, you know, what do we see happening? How can we manage it from a channel perspective? Well, you know, as, as you're probably seeing, a stock is coming in and it's, it's, it's walking out the door half the time because of the huge demand. So what, we, what we're encouraging really partners and resellers to do is really plan, plan, plan it again, again, you know, uh, is, you know, if you're working on a on a right, okay, what's in stock now? You're going to let the customer, you're going to let the school down. I think you know we we have to be, you know, reach out to Exertis uh, in terms of you know really trying to understand the 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 the, the delivery situation. Um, but really plan with the schools. You know, look look to 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 that next phase of, of when they're looking for devices. You know, what's on the water now from not just us, but from everybody is 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 a consequence of what's what's gone on and being produced three months ago that that's how that's how long we're working in the channel at the moment so you know advice to all, all, all the resellers on this call right now is yeah plan 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 um and i, I think that that sort of you know leads on to the, to the other question jay that you said about you know the roadmap and, and and challenges there that basically you know vendors like ourselves are sort of facing i mean what we've Acer, as a, from, from its own perspective, as uh, you know, education being being a significant part of our business within the commercial space, you know, it's really is part of our heart. Now we've been been working on on various uh, product specifications, things like antimicrobial um, glass and and um, silver ion solutions, which basically, you know, we're now going to have across our Chromebook and Windows devices. 
So the challenges that, and, and obviously the pandemic and, and uh, the issues around transmission of, of the uh, COVID-19, through innovations like that actually in technology, will really help those, those those environments, those classroom environments, learning environments, whether it's at home or whether it's in a hybrid learning space in, in a university or in, or in a school. So um, those are really, you know, we're not just talking, you know, the glass, we're talking about the keyboard, the palm rest, uh, touchpad, all of those things will we'll have, you know, those solutions. So those, those type of options are now coming through in our roadmap. Um, and I, I think it's really important that those type of uh, benefits are basically provided to to, to the schools and uh, and the learning environments because it's you know we don't want this to happen again as i think duncan said about you know the risk factors that, that schools and universities and uh, colleges will look at if this happens again have i got the right equipment to you know and the right environment to prevent uh, you know the spread this is going to be a key factor so i think we've we we have coming through those type of products in, in, into our roadmap, which is which is quite exciting. And then one of the issues as well is has been connectivity. Um, you know, I think Duncan and Ed, you know, sort of touched on that as well briefly. Which is, um, you know, it's one thing getting device into the hands of of of, um, of students, but and, and teachers. You know, do they have the right Wi-Fi connectivity, and uh, does the device have the right connectivity? And you know, we're all learning and working from home at the moment. When we go into the school environment, is a dongle the right, the right, the right uh, solution? It's a solution, but is it the right one when you know you're transferring? I think for about that journey from home to school, you know, and, and and moving around when we're out of this 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 pandemic. So our roadmaps also are developing quite rapidly in terms of you know the, uh, LTE. Um, so um, ensuring that you know that connectivity problem is not a problem, um, you know, for for the device. So uh, we've got uh, solutions like our um, uh, Qualcomm Snapdragon device coming through later on um, in the year. Really exciting product um, on Chrome. And then, you know, we've got a periphery of basically, you know, Intel LTE devices as well across our even entry level devices like our B3 and, and B1s, which are, you know, very much traditional sort of K12 devices all the way up to sort of enterprise grade devices. So um, that's a really, really key thing for us. And then also ensuring that, um, the deployment piece is 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 also crucial within within the technology. So um, having the ability and the platforms to do things like zero touch enrollment or using autopilot, those type of things. So having the right mechanisms 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 in place within our product roadmap, making sure that okay these devices are autopilot compatible. They're also you know zero touch compatible. Um, so. They're considerations, and that's how we're developing our roadmap. So you'll see, you know, from us, you'll see, you know, that connect connectivity uh, piece really being being um, sped up. Um, you'll also see uh, uh, elements such as sustainability as well. Um, you know, that that will be a challenge when those devices are going into schools um, over that. Well, certainly over the last twelve months, and continue as we see the growth in education. You know, there'll be a point in two, three years' time that those devices will probably need to be refreshed at some point. So we've got to think about how do we actually manage those those type of life cycle of, of the product. And uh, so those are the things that we're working on within our roadmap and changing elements, whether it be the components that we're using, um, all those type of elements that we're, we're we're considering in our roadmap. So our roadmap's constantly evolving, as as you know, it's the same as as, as most other device manufacturers, but. I think what the pandemic is doing now is really solidifying actually the real the real issues that we're facing uh, now and also for the future. Um, and I think you know one of the one of the other I think the last question uh, that you said there was sort of around some of the challenges that we've seen in terms of schools when they're deploying devices. Um, one of the one of the key things that that we've seen is really when you get the device in the hands of, of the students. Okay, what next? And uh, I think Ed. Said it very, very clearly that um, you know when a device gets into the hand of the student, you know then what 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 happens? You know we've got to we've got to ramp up that excitement, getting the teacher engaged, the students engaged in, in in key subjects like STEM subjects. So um, in, I think for for resellers, it's really important that they think about that 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 ecosystem in terms of when they're deploying devices, they're they're actually a trusted advisor. 
we're not just thinking about the the, um, the the device itself. We're thinking, okay, what happens when that device is in the hand of the student and the teacher? Are we enabling that that, that teacher to get the best out of that device, but also supporting that school for the long term? So I, I think you know uh, programs that ASA has, and uh, you know such as our STEM Rewards program, you know sort of provide that 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 support. So, um, you know, for example, that the STEM rewards will give basically the schools um, access to half a day's workshop, either in the school when when they when when we get back, when we get ahead of this, or it can be a half a day's workshop online, uh, and it can be training around whether it be Google Classroom, um, it will be uh, you know, sort of Windows Autopilot, Teams, for example, that type of thing. So, um, those are those are all considerations to to have, and I think it's really important that resellers right now are that trusted advisor and, and they're really thinking about what do I do to help the school get the best out of those devices. So uh, yeah, they're, they're the considerations that we're, that we're working on right now. Absolutely. No, thank you, Nick. That was really, really insightful. And I think one of the things you talked about there was people's digital strategy. Um, and, you know, once the device is in the hands of, of, of the student or the teacher, what's next? And I think, you know, certainly from Chris's perspective, Ava, um, you know, how has, how has Ava effectively helped schools to, to adapt to more of a remote and hybrid learning environment? You're on mute, Chris. <laughs> See how many times we can tally that up today. <laughs> Brilliant, I wasn't the only one. <laughs> can you hear me? Yes, we can. Yep. Yes. Perfect. Fantastic. Apologies, guys. Network just, just dropped out. So, yeah, to um, to echo the points of obviously Duncan and um, Ed, obviously we're seeing obviously plans ramped up. Obviously, what were five year digital plans around digital transformation were were changed to five days. Obviously, in terms of a, an administration perspective at a school level, obviously the traditional methods that educators would use to deliver hybrid learning and remote learning seriously ramped up and evolved from lockdown one to lockdown three. Um, we're seeing that a number of teachers at the moment are not looking to utilize the devices that are being prescribed to them by the educators themselves and by the schools. They're looking at ways and means to obviously seek advanced solutions. And obviously as Duncan touched on, we're working on a, a solution around a hybrid classroom for uh, obviously further education and higher education. Um, in terms of Microsoft Teams adoption, um, at the beginning of the pandemic, there was 32 million global users of Microsoft Teams, whether you're using it in the workplace or whether you're using it in the education environment. There's now 115 million users of Teams. It's, it's, it's incredible the amount of scale um, around the remote learning and online learning. So in terms of obviously how we can support um, obviously education institutions start their digital transformation journey and what we've done in terms of the last 12 months, um, we worked with the Ministry of Education in uh, in France and we delivered 15,500 of our CAM 340 cameras. And every teacher and every educator within France were given a CAM 340 plus. Um, the opportunity to drive video, voice, unified communications is massive. The meeting room solutions for video, 2% um, adoption a year ago. No, moving forward and once we go back to work and once we go back to uh, to school and obviously the students return, there'll be more uh, connected devices. It will all about, be about collaboration. It's about driving um, a digital experience and obviously being a market leader in the visualizer space. Um, we've deployed as a result of the pandemic, 460,000 visualizers globally. Um, we couldn't manufacture the goods quick enough. Um, we were having to air freight stock in purely because we couldn't afford to wait three months for the goods to be shipped on the, over on the longboat. Reality is the demand for the products, whether it's laptops, whether it's Chromebooks, whether it's tablets, visualizers, connectivity and control solutions, wireless collaboration, the demand for collaborative technologies has skyrocketed. And obviously it's an enabler to deliver best in class education and uh, experience to uh, both educators and um, students alike. As a joint uh, up entity in terms of what our job is as vendors and distributors, in terms of how we can help, there's a massive role for us to play in terms of helping bridge the technology gap. And um, we can offer through Exertis 
a wealth of vendor partners who have got complementary technologies that will deliver an ecosystem of products. So you could offer a kind of a classroom as a service proposition that could be financed with budgets being constrained. Obviously, I'm working with Duncan on the Learn From Anywhere proposition. I've been working with a number of other key partners in terms of building up a strategic alliance perspective, just so we can drive more of a solutions-based approach rather than shifting of tin. When we do go back to, obviously, work and when we do go back to school, um, it's all about driving user adoption, echoing, obviously, uh, Ed's point and Duncan's point and everybody else's point on the call thus far. Without the necessary training and without the necessary adoption of the devices, the students and the, the educators are going to be clueless. They need to have a robust training and learning schedule around how to promote and enable technology within the classroom and uh, learning environments, whether that's on premise or um, obviously virtually. So uh, we're seeing um, a great deal of demand for our video portfolio, for our visualizers, um, for a number of our different education technology. So um, obviously, we as a business have grown as a result of the pandemic. And um, we will continue to grow after after that. And once we come out of lockdown free, um, we'll continue to see uh, demand for the products that we're uh, obviously taking to market at the moment. Distance learning is a massive opportunity for our reseller partner network at this moment in time. Everybody is looking to practice social distancing. The number of students in the classroom will be fewer than before. Video conferencing is an enabler. We need to work with our reseller partners to deliver best of breed solutions that will fit nicely within their portfolio that they can take to market and deliver value to the uh, to the end user base as well. So um, there's lots that we can do. It's about, as I said, delivering a digital transformation strategy collectively in partnership with um, with with the distribution partners and resellers to drive uh, to drive a value added approach. Amazing. No, thanks, Chris. That, that that's really fascinating. And I think you know a couple of points you uh, you've raised there around you know one in the UK schools are coming back going back next month is my understanding or starting to come back. And secondly, you talked around that contactless um, environment that we've got to plan for. And I think that's where I'd, I'd like to hear from David. Uh, in terms of how you know screen beam are, are placed to assist with the schools coming back and the new hybrid learning model that we're going to have to adapt there we go i'm not on mute um yes thank you uh, yeah i think one of the things that we are looking at certainly is that contactless environment something that we didn't really think about before uh covid as a as a feature um but it certainly has come to the forefront when you have teachers returning to the classroom um, and how do you plan for that that environment and i know not everybody's going to be coming back at the same time but you still want to consider what the effects are of of a more contactless environment well that means that you're going to have uh the need for you know having to buttons on the wall things to to clean uh, maybe more more considerations about cleaning those things and about making sure that all that is is done and so creating that environment can have other ripple effects if you will um, on time and money spent as well so when you when you do come back to the classroom that ability i think one of the things that um, i think it was duncan that said um, you know we don't want to let the technology dictate what happens when you teach uh, when it comes to that teacher the craft of teaching uh, teachers are made uh taught and and learn to be agile in the classroom they learn to be um be able to move around the room and when oftentimes when you use technology uh you feel like you're stuck in one place sometimes and so when you combine that idea of okay as a teacher i need to be able to have that agility i need the ability to be able to um, have a contactless environment and i want to be able to use my devices that i have in the fullest that's where wireless display, which is what we're talking about a lot with uh, schools around the world, is that's almost become a necessity now. I don't wanna walk into my room and now have cables anymore. I wanna be able to have that wireless solution that, um, that I was maybe used to even having at home uh, in the classroom. And so when you create that environment in the classroom, it does give teachers the ability to uh, practice their craft in a way that is more natural when they're using technology. And I think that's one of the things that 
I really loved about what Ed said is that now the focus, even though technology kind of got left, you know, as a as a uh, off the off the table a little bit, all of a sudden now it's hyper focused. And so, how do we approach that from a teaching perspective? Um, and make that uh, make sure we're integrating that in the right way, not letting technology drive it, but find out, okay, what do my teachers, when I'm looking at schools and what they're trying to do, how do teachers, how they're more comfortable teaching with technology? Okay, now how do I apply that? And that's where, again, uh, when we talk about with schools and superintendents that we work with here in the United States and obviously in, in overseas there, um, you know, how do we provide that environment in the quickest and easiest way? And one of the things is uh, looking at a wireless solution. When you walk into the room, I can be able to connect to whatever camera or screen I need to be able to do wirelessly and then be able to continue teaching and um, and making that as easy as possible. And so that's where you know we are applying our, our technology in providing that environment. Um, and even in the, in the UC space, uh, which again, where hybrid environments are starting to pop up more as we've talked about in this call, uh, even we have developed solutions with ScreenBeam that integrate uh, wireless display into a UC environment. And so all, like I said, like we talked about all these folks that are on the call with cameras and and and, and devices and, and screens and, and things like that. We've got solutions as resellers that we can, you can bring us in and say, hey, how do I create that environment? And, you know, working together is where we, where we work best and how we work best. So, um, yeah, I think that's a, without taking up too much time, I think that's a good way to think about this is letting us all work together uh, and to serve the students and to serve the teachers uh, as best as possible and creating those those right environments that last a long time, not just for the immediate future. Hey, absolutely fascinating, David. And I think a, a number of people have talked about it today is that there's all these devices out there now, but what do we do when children start to come back to school and I think right. that's a wonderful segue into Craig from Lock and Charge in terms of you know what how can Lock and Charge help and support from that perspective Craig? Cheers Jamie well again everything you guys have said so far has been really valid and it's it's conversations we've been having for a long time now we sort of we we all often refer to ourselves mainly internally as the last mile of a solution when we're talking about a whole ecosystem we're often the last mile so everything the sexy stuff is the cameras, the software, the applications to put it all together, the actual device itself. But as, as Ed, Ed was mentioning earlier, early on in the pandemic, we saw a flood of devices go out. But what we're almost seeing now is the backwash, is they're all starting to come back into the schools now. And we had the conversations with a few schools that actually said, and resellers, to be fair as well, said, we understand this very early on and we're in position. But We've actually seen a real, this week alone, since Boris confirmed the 8th of March is the day schools are going back. This week has been crazy with schools saying that realisation has hit them that all of these devices or these devices are coming back into the classroom, especially at a primary school uh, and a secondary school level where all of a sudden they're coming back in and they've got hundreds of devices that they've got. Home. And whilst everything that everyone's spoken about on on so far, uh, so far is massively relevant. It all falls down if a the device isn't there, b it's there but not charged, and three it's too complicated to get it into the hands of the teacher or the student at the beginning of a classroom. And Ed mentioned it right at the beginning is where we need to make it as easy as possible for teachers. The and and Duncan, your stat I think was 21% of teachers are not comfortable with it. I'm sure Duncan and Ed will back me on this. As all it needs is the NQTs are quite fine with all of this stuff, um, but the older school teacher is always almost that resistor within the within the within the, the school or the or the organisation. All it takes is one or two, one lesson not to go how they plan. I'll schedule that out of my um, out of my lesson plan, and all of a sudden they phase it out. And school governors such as Ed will turn around and say, "What are we doing with the Chromebooks?" Six months on. And the teachers have lost confidence because one, they're not there. Two, oh, they're never ready. They're never charged. They're never in the right place. We can never find them when we need them. That's, I think, a real, it's quite a boring conversation, I suppose, but it, it's one that has a massive effect on everything else that you're planning to do. If the device isn't there, ready to use, everything falls apart. And um, we've seen it just from the growth of Chromebooks over the last few years, especially in inner city schools, which are typically old uh, Victorian buildings. 
they haven't got the space for tons of carts, the, the, the traditional car box on wheels that charges things that we, we produce, but also what we've had the conversations there has been around, well, have you looked at wall mountable solutions? Have you looked at basket solutions that will allow you to keep them in a central location and easily move them from A to B around the school because you physically haven't got the space for four or five 30 bay carts to sit in a small inner city school, which putting the amount of technology is going into a classroom now. Um, classrooms are busy enough as it is without putting a, a box on wheels that's going to take up a ton of space. Maybe it's that time to start thinking what we were looking at a year, two years ago as a solution. Doing the same again now probably isn't going to work. We need to start thinking apples for apples isn't necessarily going to be the right way to go. Um, so I really think it's a, it's a good time and we're already seeing it, as I said, um, to really start considering as, as resellers speaking to, to the schools and ask that really simple question is what happens when those devices come back? Have you got a solution for moving them around the classroom? Have you got a solution for keeping them safe, keeping them charged up, keeping them secure, being able to move them around uh, within and making them accessible for as many people within the school as possible? Whilst that's the two sides to it as well, whilst that isn't necessarily relevant to sort of Duncan's audience in the, the higher and further education because they're a little bit more responsible for their own devices. But another question we've had, we've been asking to a lot of retailers, and we've heard that it's a problem for them um, over the pandemic is getting the devices into the hands of students. We spoke about having students have those devices. How do you physically get them to a student in the first place? Um, and we're seeing a lot more loan devices, so you can come and borrow one. Um, for, um, such solutions at the moment most schools universities college will do that is you go and see the guy from it he signs it out he hands it over to you off you go and there's a spreadsheet that's manually updated what we've we've got and um with our with our fuel and, and cloud solutions is we can automate that for you so you can have one of our towers um jamie could say to me greg i need to come and borrow a laptop or i need to come into school day today but i want to be socially distanced i can say jamie go to locker number one here's your pin number you can go into there, retrieve a new, a new device, whether it be a tablet, whether it be a camera, whether it be a laptop, whatever it may be. You can go and retrieve that, close the door and off you go. You haven't actually physically seen anyone or had to interact with anyone. You've just done it all over email or on over the phone. And that that can give us something to look at moving forward. We've The horse has already bolted with all of the devices going out and they're all now starting to come back in. But I think we've started to learn lessons about how we get people, uh, replacement devices into people's hands, how we can have a loan pool uh, and actually manage that. So I think these are all conversations that we've been having for a long time, but as everyone said, we've, we've fast forwarded five, 10 years here, and all of a sudden it's it's right in people's face. And we did um, we did a show recently, a, a virtual event for, for healthcare organizations, and they've jumped even further. Their, sort of, their roadmap was 10, 15 years, and they're actually there already. And it's causing chaos for some of those as well. I think in education, you're we're already having the conversations. Nick, you probably had this a million times where someone says, I want to buy 50 Chromebooks or 50 laptops. You say, whoa, 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 whoa. you haven't got any Wi-Fi. Slow down, go back. Let's go step by step. We're already educators and schools are already understanding that. But I think what we need to do now is start tweaking those processes to make them easier for schools and just make them think a little bit more, challenge them in the way that they've done things before, because what they've been doing isn't necessarily going to work when they come back into school into this new environment. Amazing. No, thank you, Craig. That's really interesting. We've actually overrun, but uh, to be honest with you, I, I think it was thoroughly enjoyable. And, and so we, we kind of kept things going uh, to see out the hour. Um, I want to say thank you to all of our, our panelists today for your contribution. I think it's been thoroughly, thoroughly um, enjoyable to listen to and educational. Um, I uh, would also like to say that uh, all the contact details of our panelists are on our LinkedIn page. So we have put a post out. So if you want to get in contact with them, uh, you can do so via LinkedIn for sure. And um, also don't forget to claim your free STM game change backpack. And it has been game changing for us this year. You know, everything we've had to learn fast and we've had to adapt quickly. And that journey is not ending because the kids are starting to go back to school on the 8th of March. It's only just beginning. And I think it's really, really important that we all work together as a community in technology and with education to make sure that we are best placed 
to maximise the opportunities created through this, what has been a challenging time, but also moved us so further forward in terms of the technology and the way of learning uh, and made it so much more interactive, albeit remote. So there's lots to be taken from today. Uh, thank you for your time. I look forward to speaking with uh, many of you, hopefully face to face soon. Um, and uh, I wish everybody a good rest of your day. Thanks, Jamie. Thanks a lot. Thank Cheers. You. Thanks. 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 Stay safe. Keep working.